Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 76 of Left Side of the Aisle. It's for the week of, um, what is it, October 6th, uh, 4th to 10th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And uh, my uh, email, uh, my website will be up around here a couple times during the show. And if you didn't catch the email, you can get it from there. The only thing I ask about email is that if you do send it, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. Okay, with that rather abbreviated introduction, because I've got a lot of stuff I want to get through today, we're going to get going. I'm going to start, as I always like to do, with uh, when I can, with a bit of good news. Um, it's a small victory, but still a significant one. Uh, and it comes from an area where most of the good news seems to come from this day. Uh, these days, Lord knows there's not enough on, on, uh, on the economy, on privacy, on government secrecy, on ongoing wars and all the rest. But uh, we do... Uh, from time to time get some good news in the area of same-sex marriage and LGBT rights. Consider this scenario. One partner of a same-sex couple is found to have at some point in the past entered the country illegally. They are targeted, uh, that person is targeted for deportation. Now, even if their partner is a U.S. citizen, even if they were married legally in one of the states that recognize same-sex marriage, even if they're living in one of those states, that does them absolutely no good because the federal level Defense of Marriage Act um, does not recognize that marriage. Uh, it declares that marriage is one man and one woman and non-heterosexuals need not apply. Uh, however, the government still has prosecutorial discretion in deciding what cases to pursue. And among the things that uh, immigration agents are supposed to consider in deciding whether or not to pursue a case is the particular individual's ties to their community and their relationships. Well, last Thursday, September 27th, Janet Napolitano, who is the secretary of the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland, uh, she instructed agents of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is appropriately acronymed ICE, um, what she told them was that in considering a person's ties to their community, they are to understand the uh, term family relationships to include what she called long-term same-sex partners. Now, the Defense of Marriage Act does not allow the agency to call these people married. However, from now on, at least they will be considered family. Uh, and while the Defense of Marriage Act itself needs to be sent on the dustbin of bigotry from which it came, um, this at least, this shift in policy at least, is a good thing. So I'd like to start with that. But from there, we're going to move right ahead to our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. This is actually an outrage of last week because I missed it when it happened, but it still deserves the appropriate sneering. It happened on Meet the Press on September 23rd. Now, the right wing has been hyping all this business about how 46% of people supposedly pay no income tax and they're, they're loafers and freeloaders and the rest. Um, of course, those people still pay a whole lot of other taxes, payroll taxes, excise taxes, sales taxes, property taxes. They may pay state or local income taxes. But in any event, the host of Meet the Press, David Gregory, was apparently, he, by the way, he would probably, he'd be high on a list of nominees for Media Clown of the Year, okay? But he was apparently suckered in by this right-wing chant. And he asked on Meet the Press, he asked Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick if poor people should re be required to pay some federal income tax. That is, no matter how low their income, they should owe something. There should be no level of poverty so severe that it's below a taxable income. Now, Patrick was obviously caught off guard, and he rather lamely and rather stupidly answered, maybe, uh, saying, this, he said it's the first time he'd heard of this idea. Well, Gregory was not about to let Patrick think about something that he said he'd never heard about before, and he pressed him for an immediate answer. Um, he wanted to know, Gregory wanted to know if poor people, indeed if even the poorest people, should, in his words, have some skin in the game. What? 
have some skin in the game? I mean, is he joke? What kind of nonsense is this? Now, wanting the poorest among us to put out more of what they already don't have just so they can have skin in the game? Well, you know, maybe it occurs to me, actually, maybe poor people should put skin in the game because they don't have anything else to put in. Instead of talking about skin in the game, maybe Gregory should have been talking about a pound of flesh. Oh, but we're t it's only a little bit of taxes. Only like maybe only a dollar or something. Just a little bit of taxes, just so you can have skin in the game. I mean, we know you don't have m enough money for food. We know you don't have enough money for shelter. Uh, we know you don't have money for uh, for, for a doctor or a dentist. Uh, we know that clothes from Savers are a real treat for you. You know, but what's really important is you have skin in the game. And if that means you have even less money for food, for shelter, for clothing, for health care, for heat, for anything else, well, that's, that's just the way it goes because at least you have a dollar's worth of skin in the game. But of course it's not just a dollar, it never is. For some people living at or just above the poverty line, this could mean a difference of thousands of dollars a year. Um, Put in this sort of minimum tax, this alternative minimum tax into effect, would require eliminating the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. And those are programs that, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, those two programs alone lifted 9.2 million families out of poverty in 2010. Oh, and by the way, that poverty line? It's ridiculously low. It really is. It's absurdly low. For example, do this. You're a couple. Imagine you're a couple. No kids, just the two of you. Could you survive on a gross income of $290 a week? Could you? Remember, that's everything. That's everything. That's rent, heat, utilities, phone, food, clothing, health care, gasoline, everything. Could you do that? Well, you better be able to because according to the federal government's guidelines for 2011, you're not poor. All right, finally on this. Yes, I know what the term skin in the game means. And I also know it doesn't mean what the right wing and cement heads like David Gregory are trying to make it mean. It referred to executives, top executives of corporations investing in their own stock, the stock of their own companies, so that they would share some of the financial risk of that company's performance. What we're seeing here is not executives taking on risk for their own companies. What we're seeing is rich people trying to suck more money out of the poor, money that could legitimately and fairly be called blood money because of the effect it will have on poor people's lives. Rich people trying to suck more money out of the poor in order to protect their own privileged tax breaks. That is disgusting, it is immoral, and it is an outrage. It is the outrage of the week. All right, from there, I want to lighten this up just a bit. Uh, I was going to talk some stuff about voter ID laws this week, but I'm going to let that pass for something else having to do with voting because I just want to get this in. This is just too funny. This is the Clarabelle Award, uh, given as needed for acts of meritorious stupidity. Now, do you remember how Witless Romney said that 47% of Americans uh, um, think that they're victims? Well, let me tell you something. Nobody out victims the right wing. Now, you surely heard, if you paid any attention at all, that the polls in the presidential race, both nationally and in the swing states, as they're called, have, have actually moved in favor of Barack Obama over the last couple of weeks. In fact, uh, last week, 10 polls, all 10 polls that came out that week, had, had Obama ahead. Now, the right wingers' response to this, the GOP's response to this, they whine, the polls are skewed, they're biased, sniffle, sniffle, whine. Now, no, no, no. the point is the polls could be wrong, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying the polls, all 10 of them, including a Fox News poll, are being deliberately manipulated to show Obama in the lead. Now, again, the polls could be wrong, they have been before, but I mean deliberately skewed? There is some vast conspiracy among all these organizations, including, again, Fox News, in order to show Obama ahead? Seriously? What would be the point of this? Well, 
Leave it to the head of the Republican Party, Rush Limburger, to bring the answer straight from bizarro world. He said, and I'm quoting him here, I think they're trying to get this election finished and in the can by suppressing your vote and depressing you so that you don't think there's any reason to vote, that it's hopeless. They want you making other plans. Okay, did you get that? According to Lush, never mind all the photo ID laws, never mind all the restrictions on registrations, never mind all the new hurdles between the voter and the voting booth, never mind all the studies showing the main people that are, that are affected by this are the poor, the young, the old, and minorities, never mind all that. According to him, according to Rush Limburger, it is the right wing that is really the target of a campaign of voter suppression. It doesn't get more clownish than that. And we're going to take a break. Hi, welcome back. And uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the show talking about the election, uh, the presidential election in particular, because I start with what I'm going to do, <laughs> I am not voting for Barack Obama. In fact, I cannot stand the idea of voting for Barack Obama. Now, anyone who's seen this show, in fact, anyone who's seen this particular episode of the show, uh, cannot possibly imagine I would have anything good to say about Whitless Romney or Paul Ranton. Uh, but you should realize, quite frankly, that the list of crimes, some of them philosophical crimes, some of them moral crimes, some of them possibly actually crime crimes, of which Barack Obama is guilty is long and it gets longer by the day. Okay, crimes? Isn't that a rather strong word? All right, suppose I try to defend that assertion by giving you a revised version of something I said to you four weeks ago. Here are 10 reasons I will not vote for Barack Obama. One, he has presided over a massive expansion of government surveillance of our personal lives. Warrantless wiretapping has quadrupled under his administration. The National Security Agency is about to open a new facility for the specific purpose of intercepting, deciphering, analyzing, and storing a vast amount of data that goes over communication lines, both domestic and foreign. Uh, two. He is engaged in an unprecedented attack on whistleblowers. The Obama administration has already charged six people for, under the Espionage Act, for leaking classified information. That is quite literally double the number of people indicted under that act for whistleblowing under all previous administrations throughout the entire history of the act, which dates back to 1917. Three. He has promised the most transparent administration ever, but has instead established the most secretive administration of modern times. Uh, neither with, with major programs and policies, um, especially as related to the use of military force, carried out, organized and carried out in secret without public debate or often even knowledge. Four. He has engineered the widest, most serious expansion of executive power ever to a degree Bush and Cheney only dreamed of. He's taken every excess that they, they claimed on presidential authority, on secrecy, on the bogus uh, um, uh, state secrets privilege, and has done as much or more. He claimed he was against the Patriot Act, but when it came up for renewal, he supported it. Under the National Defense Authorization Act, which he signed, he has the power to indefinitely detain without trial or even charge anyone he, in his own personal, unreviewable opinion, deems to be giving substantial support to some terrorist associated force, whatever that means. He's even asserted and acted on the authority to kill anyone, including American citizens on foreign soil, if he, and again in his own unreviewable, unjudgeable uh, determination, decides that person is a terrorist. Five, our Nobel Peace Prize president is a warmonger. He waged war on Libya in violation of the War Powers Act. He tried to pressure Iraq into having U.S. troops there after the withdrawal deadline. He has waged secret wars in, in Yemen and Somalia. He has dramatically expanded the drone war in Pakistan that daily terrorizes the people of northwest Pakistan and in which, despite all the official lies about surgical strikes and precision instruments and casualties in the single digits, hundreds of innocent people have been killed in those strikes and more die daily. 
Before Obama entered office, there had been one military strike in Yemen. Under his administration, there have been over 110. Under George, uh, under George Bush, there were 50 drone strikes in Pakistan. Under Obama, there have been 400, excuse me, 300. Under Bush, there were over 400 casualties from those attacks. Under Obama, there had been five times as many. Six, he has failed to prosecute war criminals and torturers. After coming into office loudly proclaiming nobody is above the law, uh, Obama immediately set out to shield all the war criminals of the Bush gang, including the people who actually did the torturing, not only from criminal prosecution, but from civil actions and congressional investigations as well. Even where prisoners were killed, there was no punishment, there was no prosecution. For six years, from 2001 to 2007, the United States maintained what amounted to an officially sanctioned torture regime. And from across all that time, all the torture, all the torturers, all their enablers, only one person is being prosecuted for anything related to torture. That person's name is John Kiriakou, and he didn't torture anybody. He's one of those whistleblowers I mentioned. His crime was telling us about it. He now faces possible 45 years in prison for telling us what was being done. The message from the Obama administration is clear, okay, do the dirty work, uh, kidnap, torture, kill, uh, we'll cover for you. Destroy the evidence of that, we'll cover for you. Let the public know what's being done in their name and we'll send you to prison essentially for the rest of your life. Seven, he has beaten the war drums against Iran, talking about red lines and staging large-scale military operations in the Persian Gulf. Uh, this despite the fact that U.S. officials will admit when you press them that there really is no evidence that Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon. He's already initiated a cyber war against Iran, using computer worms to try to destroy the country's infrastructure. This is something the Pentagon says would be an act of war if it was done against the United States. But because we're doing it to Iran, the White House regards it as a great foreign policy triumph. Eight, Afghanistan. Out now. Not two years of pointless death and bloodshed and havoc from now. Now. Every day that that war continues, every day he does not pull out is another moral crime. Nine, he has failed to prosecute Wall Street crooks. Indeed, from the beginning of his term, he surrounded himself with Wall Street insiders and hacks. In fact, this administration went so far as to specifically refuse to follow up on criminal referrals from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission or from a congressional report, both of which provided documented evidence of fraud. 10. Barack Obama wants to cut Medicare. He wants to cut Social Security. He wants the so-called grand bargain that would sacrifice the poor and the elderly on an altar of, of, uh, of debt re deficit reduction in exchange for a few token tax increases on the rich, which shouldn't even be called increases because they would be an end to what were labeled temporary reductions when they put into place. He wants that grand bargain enough that he has actually whined and groused about how he doesn't get enough credit for how much he wants it. I am not voting for, I will not vote for Barack Obama. I'm voting for Jill Stein of the Green Rainbow Party. But now the thing is, as soon as anybody says that, you can be sure, you can be absolutely sure, as sure as the sun rising in the east, that the response will be the stare of, what, you'd rather Romney won? In fact, it's so sure that it doesn't matter what the election is or, or what the election is for or who's running. Suggest you're voting for a third party and you will get a, oh, you'd rather if, fill in the name of the villain du jour, uh, you'd rather they won. Followed, it will be followed quickly by some haughty denunciation to the foolishness of wasting your vote. Well, the proper answer to the first part of that is, of course not, don't be stupid. The response to the second part is, it is never a waste to vote for what you believe in. Eugene Debs said, I'd rather vote for what I want and not get it than vote for what I don't want and get it and voting for Barack Obama is voting for all those things I just listed. <laughs> all right, now look, I'm a moralist, absolutely, but I'm also a realist, especially in regards to myself. I try to be anyway.
I know, I admit, that if I was in a toss-up state, and I mean an actual toss-up, not a swing state, which means it votes one way or another way, but an actual toss-up state where it looked like the election was really close, I'd be tempted to vote for Obama. Yes, I admit it. I'd have to do it with my tongue because I'd have one hand covering my eyes and the other holding my nose, but I suppose I could do it. Oh, and by the way, note that the word could rather than would was chosen deliberately there. But the thing is, there's more involved here. There's more involved in a general sense than the immediate practicalities of the next two or four years. You know, some people talk about not voting for Obama or any other Democrat to teach them a lesson so that they'll lose. The lesson is, that it's intended to teach is there is a price to be paid for ignoring us. There's a point to the right beyond which you cannot pull us. But I have to then point out here that I am not talking about, as some do, just not voting at all as a means of teaching them a lesson. I mean, I, that I think is idiotic. B because the thing is, not voting as a means of protest fails because your protest is invisible to the people you're protesting. Uh, all they'll see is a lower turnout, which you know, may produce a bigger get out the vote campaign next time around, but uh, it won't produce any soul searching. In fact, it's more likely to push them further to the right as they go for those, you know, votes, those magical votes in the middle, in the center, which of course now has moved further to the right. On the other hand, voting, but voting for third parties, especially when clearly to the left of Obama, can teach that lesson because uh, a lesson about the price to be paid because every such vote is at least potentially one that the Democrats could have gotten if they had not been so indifferent to, to those concerns and had not ignored or worse dismissed those people's votes. In fact, I'll mention parenthetically that historically that has been the role of third parties in the United States for most of its history. Uh, demonstrating a constituency large enough for a particular idea as to threaten the electoral position of one of the major parties, which then had to shift its position to allow for that. A story on this same point, I've told this story a number of times, I may have actually told it here, I don't know. A uh, long time ago, 1984 it was in fact to be exact, I was running for Congress as an independent. I was running against a moderately liberal Democrat who was trying to keep his seat in a moderately conservative Republican district. This back in those halcyon days when the phrase moderate Republican actually meant something rational. Well, one time he asked me if I wasn't concerned that if the election was close that I might take enough votes from him to let the Republican win. I started to answer, but before I got out more than a couple of words, he waved me off with a grin. He said, never mind, he said, that's my problem, not yours. That's exactly right. It's his problem. Those who want a third party voter like me um, have exactly that same burden. It's their problem, not mine. My burden is to find the candidate I can best support, the one who best expresses my convictions, my hopes, my beliefs, the candidate I think best embodies what I hope for the nation. If Obama supporters want my vote and the vote of people like me, they have to give us a reason to do it. And it's got to be a reason that goes beyond he's not Mitt Romney. That is, it's got to go beyond arguing that despite everything, you still have to vote for Obama because he's the lesser evil. That in turn brings up the whole idea of lesser evilism. Now, we often hear about the lesser of two evils is still an evil, and which is true, but the po problem with it really is not about a particular lesser evil, but the idea that every time we do that, every time we settle for the lesser evil, we're setting that as the new standard. That becomes the new normal, the new baseline. Several folks have commented on how Richard Nixon could not have gotten the Republican nomination this year. He's too liberal. One prominent blogger just recently took, uh, posted big excerpts from the 1956 Republican presidential platform and it looked really liberal compared even to the Democratic one from 2012. Then there's the argument, we have to vote for Obama now and we'll protest like hell later. Which frankly is utter nonsense. It makes even less sense in the evil, uh, than the lesser evil line. The thing is, in one sense, I can agree with that argument. 
because I think that we need like social disruption. We need people in the streets. We need uh, no business as usual because I believe that's our best, in fact, our necessary weapon for change, no matter who's the president, no matter who's in the majority in the House or the Senate. But that's not what most of these people, these Obama bots, are referring to when they talk about protests later. They don't mean in the streets. They mean angry blog posts. They mean tut-tutting op-eds. They mean testy tweets. They mean the occasional sternly worded petition, all of which they will do, provided it does not, uh, d does not uh, risk the electoral chances of any, of any Democrat. All of these, now the point is all of these things, blog posts, op-eds, tweets, petitions, letters to the editor to Congress, all of these things have their place. They all have their uses. But unless they are connected to that kind of social disruption I talked about, and the kind of social disruption the cool kids and the Obama bots sneer at, like, like man, you know, that's so 20th century, you know? Um, unless it's connected to that kind of social disruption, why shouldn't the Democrats ignore it? We've shown that we'll, we'll go along with what they, what they say, uh, you know, as long as they can say that, well, they're not quite as bad as the other guys. If we are to stop slowly strip, uh, slipping backwards, if we're not to be satisfied by the occasional uptick in the course of the overall general decline, if we're actually truly to reverse that decline, if we're actually truly to reverse the decline that has seen economic inequality steadily increase and mean income slowly decline across presidencies, parties, politicians over the last 30 years, the decline that has seen our privacy slowly stripped away while government secrecy increases. The decline that has seen civil liberties increasingly limited and the ability to protest increasingly limited. The decline that has seen a nation that once claimed to be a light unto the world become a blight unto the world. If we are actually truly to reverse that decline, then at some point the lesser evil has to cross over into not good enough and therefore no. Some folks have already crossed that line. Personally, I'm right up against it, which is why I said I could vote for Obama rather than that I would. Yes, there is a risk here. Yes, there's a risk to this. Yes, there is a risk you could lose. You could lose big with all of the harm and damage that means to other people. But unless we are prepared to take that risk, unless we're prepared to risk losing, we will never win in any way more than the short term. Josh Marshall, he's a journalist, he's no radical, he got it right. The key condition, I'm quoting him here, the key condition of political success, he said this a couple of years ago, the key condition of political success is almost, almost always a genuine willingness to lose well. Put another way, every time we settle for the lesser evil, we are saying that our greatest hope for the long term is for things to get worse more slowly than they otherwise might, which is precisely what vote for Obama because he's not Romney is arguing. Now, frankly, my hope is at a low ebb, but I'm not willing to give up what hope I have left uh, by limiting my options to merely not losing rather than hoping to win. Um, I'm voting for Jill Stein. I am not voting for Barack Obama. Don't even ask me to. And that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. We will see you next week.